Hello and welcome to The Carter Report. I'm your host today. My name is Danny Shelton, and thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to have a special guest, none other than President, CEO, you name it, Chairman of The Carter Report, Pastor John Carter. Pastor Carter, it's good to have you here today at The Carter Report. This is kind of a switch, isn't it? Thank you, Danny. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here. You've, today, you're going to be blessed because Elder Carter has a ministry that I've respected for so many years, and I respect him as a man of God and his family for what they're doing for the cause of God around the world. I'm here in beautiful new studios in Moore Park, California, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So right now, go grab your friends, your enemies, everybody. Tell them, come and stay tuned to The Carter Report. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello and welcome back. I'm Danny Shelton here at the Carter Report with Pastor John Carter. Pastor Carter, this is different, I know, for you today. Yeah. You're usually doing the interviews, but today I'm getting to the privilege of interviewing I'm you. I'm glad to be here today. And uh, you know what? I respect you so much. I already mentioned earlier for what you do for the cause of God, for your vision. Elder Carter is incredible. You have worked literally around the world. I want to find a little bit of, uh, go to the background of you a little bit. Mm. Where are you from, obviously? Now, most of us can tell, and we've heard you're from Australia. Tell me a little bit about your childhood upbringing. I was born <clears throat> in a tiny little town in Queensland by the name of Esk. Mm -hmm. I went back there recently when I drove through it. That was quite a few years ago now, Danny. Yes. And I spent most of my life, all of my early years, in Australia. And I've lived in this great land of the United States almost 30 years. 30 years. 29 plus years. And been on 3ABN, mm. this is a little commercial now. <laughs> been right. on 3A, uh, 3ABN, how long now? Started well, 80s. Close. About 29 years. 28, 29 yeah. years 28, ago. 29 years. Absolutely. One of the first people, I wanted to ask you that. First of all, you decided at some point in your life that you love, not only love Jesus, but you wanted to be used as an instrument of God and decided to become a pastor. How did that come about? I was a, a boy of about 15 or about 15, 14 or 15 years of age. I was going through a troubled time in my life. You know, mm -hmm. teenagers are doing it all the time. And what we did back there, we thought was really bad. But mm -hmm. by today's world, what we right. did back there sure. was pretty innocent, like sneaking at the back of the church, down the back of the church <laughs> and smoking some yeah. cigarettes and things like that. That was the biggest sin that one mm -hmm. could do. Mm -hmm. And going to the movies, mm -hmm. really bad. Oh, yeah. sure. But in my heart of hearts, I felt that God was calling to me, me to be a minister mm -hmm. and especially to be an evangelist. 
<clears throat> now, why I would think this, I cannot explain except for the grace of God. Mm -hmm. But I had this conviction that burned in my soul that I needed to go to Avondale College and train to be a pastor and most importantly, an evangelist wow. preaching the gospel around the world. That had to mm -hmm. come from God. Absolutely. So you became a pastor. Yes. And did you have churches for a number of years before yeah, you? Yeah. Tell me about it. I'm first and foremost a pastor. I'm a, an evangelist part-time. I'm only an evangelist part-time because I can't, be, can't afford to be an evangelist <laughs> full-time. <laughs> when I run a campaign right. like in El Salvador and Russia, I've got to raise, mm -hmm. you know, got to raise millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. A big campaign today costs about a million dollars. People say, mm -hmm. that's a terrible lot of money. No, it's a tiny bit of money. When you think what we spend on. Absolutely. You know, we're not going to talk about it. Yeah. But what we spend on, you know what? Sure. Yeah, the tens of millions, even the billions. Mm -hmm. But the most important work is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. But that costs a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I can only do that part-time because... Uh, even though I've got great supporters, raising a million dollars to me is still a big deal. Oh, absolutely. And if I had more money, I'd be doing more evangelism. But yeah. I am a pastor. Uh, in Australia, sometimes I would have five churches to look after. Wow. Uh, before I came over, I was the pastor of the uh, Warunga Church at mm -hmm. our headquarters on the campus of the great Sydney Adventist Hospital. Yes. So I've had a church every year, sometimes, as I said, five churches. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Texas. I love Texas. Yes. I think Texas is just a great place. Just want to say hello to the Texans. Now, how did uh, you get to Texas? Somebody uh, had to call I, I came, you. I came on the plane. <laughs> I knew you would say that. Someone had to call you and invite you to come yeah. and preach in Texas. I got a call uh, through Elder Cyril Miller. Miller. You yes. know him, yes. Elder Miller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is going back to about 1985 when I was pastor of the Great Burunga Church that I thought was mm -hmm. a magnificent church, wonderful church, <clears throat> distinguished congregation. And I got a call to go to Fort Worth, Texas. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you Texas, met, and you Texas. met a man there named Jim Gilly, who's now yeah, president that's right. of 3ABM. Yeah. And uh, Jim Gilly was extremely kind to me. Mm -hmm. because he uh, sort of babysat the church and stopped it from running away until I got there. Mm -hmm. And so Jim Gilly took me under his, under his arm and looked after me and sort of uh, initiated me into the different way of life in Texas. <laughs> I just like Texas and the Texans. Well, you were there and you came for a reason. God called you. Now, tell me about, you talked about your support but your family support. Tell us a little bit for those who don't always get to hear or see about your family. Tell us about your wife and children. I've got a super wife. She's got evangelism, and the work of the church in her soul. Absolutely. Uh, she knows more about running big public meetings. I'm talking about campaigns like Billy Graham used to run. Yes. Advertising, mm -hmm. where you, how you do it and setting up the stage. She knows more about that than any person I, I admire know. Beverly greatly. And so then I've got a son, David. He's the producer and the director of this television program, and he is a super son. Absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, he's a super son. He, is, he does uh, a great job too, directing. Yeah, he does. And, and it's, he's lucky he's got me he can direct <laughs> because he really directs me. He tells me. He comes right. down and says, Dad, you don't do it like that. And, okay, or, I love it. Mm, he says to me, you, Good. You, you talk too much today, Dad, and <clears> you <throat> didn't let Danny get a word in. I said, that takes <laughs> something. That's a talent, you know. <laughs> then I have two daughters. One is a psychologist who lives in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and uh, another daughter there who lives in San Francisco, Leanne and Julie. Mm -hmm. Leanne is the psychologist. Julie is the intensive care nurse, and uh, they live up there with, with families and so you, forth. You, you have a great family. Great family. And uh, I want to talk about now, John, we're going to talk about your evangelism. You came as a pastor. Yeah, And still within am. the Adventist church, usually we're working within the church. It's, it's unusual for pastors to say, I'm going to start doing evangelism around the world and literally still be a pastor of the church, but develop your own ministry, such as a Carter Report. And I want to say, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do it as effectively as you have done, being a pastor in the church and at the same time doing, it's almost like a separate 
ministry because you're out now raising the funds yourself. You're going to go to Russia. You're going mm. to all these countries around the world that you mentioned and some you haven't, New Guinea and all these different countries around the world. And yet you, that's a juggling act. You've got a church. You're, you're involved in evangelism. How did your church feel about that? Did they support you? Yes, they did. I've got a different philosophy to most pastors. Uh, one of my heroes was HMS Richards. You know, the great yes, preacher, HMS Richards, absolutely. the saint of God, have mm -hmm. faith in God, man. Mm -hmm. In his book, Feed My Sheep, he said, one of the mm -hmm. worst descriptions of a minister of God is to say he's a conference worker. <laughs> oh, no, he said, HMS mm -hmm. Richards said, never, never, never call me a conference worker. Right. He said, I work for God. Thank you. The conference just has the privilege of, of paying the pastors. There it's you not go. their money. Right. For crying Absolutely. out loud, it's not their money. No. It comes from the Lord's tithe. It's not, doesn't belong to the conference. Absolutely. He just uses the conference. Mm. So I've had the philosophy and the belief from the Bible that I work for God. And when the occasion arose and as God put it, an anointing upon my soul, and he did, and he gave me a vision like he gave you for 3ABN. Thank God for 3ABN. God gave me a vision like he gave to John Wesley. John Wesley said to that old frosty Anglican divine who said, go back to your own parish. John Wesley said, my parish is the world. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. God has given us a parish. It's the world. And if you're called by God and if you're working for God, then your parish is going to be bigger than your own local little parish. It's going to be the world. Mm -hmm. And I caught that vision. I say, glory be to God back in my homeland of Australia, where the church asked me to run the biggest campaigns probably in the history of Australia, in the Dallas Brooks down in Melbourne, mm -hmm. tremendous breakthrough, then in the Sydney Opera House. <clears throat> and then Beverly said to me when we were pastoring the Warunga Church and had all sorts of pastoral problems with young people who were losing their way, she said, let's take them out of this affluent area where there's so much money, let's take them into a third world country and get them away from all of these lights and let them see the power of God. And so we started to take young people overseas to places like Manila, mm -hmm. where we saw the glory of God, and to Jamaica. And I've just been doing that ever since, and God has been blessing me. Absolutely. And you mentioned earlier on another program, you've been to Russia 40, 40, 42 times. 42. What an amazing ministry. I'm sitting here with uh, Elder and Pastor John Carter, Evangelist John Carter, and I'm here at the beautiful Carter Report, new facilities here in Moore Park, California. Thank you for your love and your prayers and your financial support of the Carter Report. I can stand here in good conscience and great faith, encouraging you, pray and ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you to do in support of this great ministry. I can say things they would never say, but I can tell you this is a man of God. The Carter Report people, the vision is from God. They literally have the vision to reach the world. Thousands and thousands, yea, hundreds of thousands of people, think of that, hundreds of thousands have come to the knowledge of Christ through the ministry of John Carter and the Carter Report. Elder Carter, that's why I admire you. That's why I'm here Thank in you. support of you. And for those of you at home, we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. God has his time and his place for everything. And the time and the place now is Latin America, including Cuba. Time magazine talks about the second Protestant Reformation and describes how hundreds of thousands even millions of Latinos are coming to the gospel of Christ. I'm not an armchair theologian. I'm speaking according to experience. I've seen it with my own eyes. Recently, we went down to El Salvador. There I spoke in the largest football stadium in Central America with the biggest crowd that that football stadium had ever, ever seen. They came not to see a football match, but to hear about the blood of Christ. Millions are coming to a knowledge of God in Latin America. Doors are opening in Cuba. Who knows? We may be going to Cuba soon. As the doors open, by the grace of God, we are going to step through those doors 
and we want you to step through those doors with us and be part of our team for such a time as this. Please write to me, friend. Don't put it off. Write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358 in Australia. Write to me at Terrigal, New South Wales. Be part of the Second Reformation. Join us and see the miracles of God. Amen. Hi, I'm Danny Shelton, and I'm here at the Carter Report in Moore Park, California, interviewing none other than Pastor John Carter. Thank you. And thank do, you. And doing great. Well, thank you for yeah. being the guest today at your own facilities. Yeah. I marvel at this, really what you've done, because coming from Australia, being a pastor, and a lot of guys, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. God calls people to pastor. Sure he does. But you do that all your life. But you continue to reach out into new areas of the world, and it's because of vision that God has given you, and how better to do it than make use of all the, the technical equipment that you can, and all the new communication highways, and you're doing it here with television, and your radio, your evangelism around the world. Thank you, Elder Carter, no, for what you, you do thank for the, you for what for you the do. cause of God, and uh, doing an incredible job with the Carter Report. As an evangelist, I've talked to the folk earlier, God has uh, given you an, an, an anointing that's not to be denied. I have seen you, I can talk to you as a person, I respect you, but when you get in the pulpit, when you stand in front of the crowds, I, Danny Shelton, have seen it with my own eyes, an anointing that comes over you that supersedes John Carter. It's no longer John Carter speaking, but God is using you as an instrument. Now, don't be confused at home. People say, oh my, he's putting this guy up on a pedestal. Actually, it should be that way with all of us. Because of ourselves, we can do nothing. Through Christ, we can accomplish all things. And I use the scripture over and over again. I, if I be lifted up, Jesus says, from this earth, will draw all men unto me. So when you stand up and you represent Jesus Christ to the world, things are going to happen. The blessing is on the go. Tell me about the first big evangelistic campaign you decided to go on after you came to America. The first big evangelistic campaign after I came to the United States. I'd only just moved here and I took a bunch of young people from Australia, trying to think about it, you know. That's why yes, I'm gazing absolutely. around, trying to get my thoughts together. We took a bunch of them. We'd been over on the East Coast and we took them to Kingston, Jamaica. So that was the first campaign from here. And then the second campaign was out of Fort Worth, and we went to Harare, Zimbabwe. <clears throat> Sounds good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's uh, <laughs> Salisbury, Rhodesia, the old Salisbury of the old British colony of mm -hmm. Rhodesia. Now it's called uh, Harare, Zimbabwe. And so we've been doing this ever since. Okay. What was it that drew you to Russia? And, and why did you think you could go there so quickly and be successful when all the years of communism, it seemed like you didn't hesitate. One of the first people, not just Adventists, one of the first evangelists in the world to, to go to Russia to do a huge campaign. I got, a, I got a phone call from Pastor Robert Spangler in Washington, mm -hmm. and I was still in bed because, you know, they're, yes. they're ahead of us, so yes. they, they don't seem to realize this. That mm -hmm. If they're calling you at 9 o'clock, that's 6 o'clock when that's right. all good mm -hmm. people are still yes. sleeping. And so... <laughs> Uh, he said, uh, John, we want you to go to Moscow and test out the waters. He said, amazing things are happening in Russia. Have you heard about them? I said, yes, a little bit. He said, it's like, it's as though people were locked up in a, I remember what he's, he told me. He said, people were locked up in a building mm -hmm. and all the doors and all the windows were, were shut. They were locked shut. And then all of a sudden, all the doors burst open and the windows burst open and those people inside were seeing out, outside for the first time in their lives. And he mm -hmm. said, I want you to go over and test out the waters, see what's going to happen. So we went over there in 91 and hired the Palace of Culture. Mm -hmm. We raised the money, got some money together. Uh, we got it together from our friends and 
Paula Owens and Russell Owens came from Texas. Mm -hmm. Some of my Texans yes. came and stood sure, with me. I remember. You know yeah. them? And we went over there and we hired the Palace of Culture just down the road from the Kremlin. Danny, it was the power of God. I would start mm -hmm. preaching at nine in the morning. I was a bit younger then. Start preaching at <laughs> nine in the morning. I'd go through until 11 o'clock at night with only a pause for uh, bread and water. Mm. I'd just go one meeting after another and the people wouldn't move. And mm. you could feel the tremendous energy in the meetings and the hunger of the people. I remember once I was preaching with a translator by the name of Igor Pespekin, a Jewish Adventist Christian. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I became conscious of the fact that there was a void. There was no noise at, at all. Everything had stopped. And I looked at Igor, this big, tall Russian guy, and he was crying, mm. weeping. He couldn't go on. Then I looked out at the audience of thousands, all crying, all weeping. And I stopped and I, I said, Igor, what's going on here? He said, the people are overcome with emotion mm. that you're here and you're preaching the word and for the first time they're hearing a foreigner preach the word of God. That was the first ever evangelistic campaign in the Soviet Union by a foreigner. Glory be to God. Amazing. And in that same meeting, I remember a bunch of soldiers sitting up the back under their lieutenant or captain or whoever. And when I made an altar call, they all stood to their feet and they marched down. Down they came. All the other people coming down, but they made way. And these soldiers marched down. And uh, because the crowd was so great, I said to them, come up on the stage to the soldiers. And they marched up the stairs. They marched. They came up and they stood behind me. There was a part of the Russian army listening to the word of God. Mm. Why do I do this work? How could I not do this work? Wow. Incredible. Because God has, God has led me to do this work. There have been times when I have wished that I could have an, an easy job and I could retire and go and sit on the beach. Mm -hmm. But as, as it is written in the Bible, is there not a cause? That's what David yeah. said. Is yeah. there not a cause? Yeah, absolutely. And what a vision it takes to do that. But also probably what surprised you is how much money it would take that you have to raise yeah. to go. <laughs> you, you, he literally has to raise millions and millions of dollars uh -huh. for these I want to call them campaigns, and I'm not sure that's the right word. That's no, a good but, word. It's but, like a military it, campaign. It, yeah, that, that mm. you go, but it continues the souls. I'll never forget sitting uh, when we first went to Nizhny Novgorod. He baptized 2,532 people sitting with the governor, and the governor is saying, I want you, Elder Carter and, and uh, Mr. Shelton and Adventists out of this, the, the Russia yeah. And I was ready to pack up and go. I said, okay, this is communism's just fallen. We don't know any of these people. They're standing around with their AK 47s. Mm -hmm. and the government says, get out. I'm ready to go. And this man begins to talk. He begins to talk to the governor. And I thought he'd never be quiet. And I said, they're going to lock us up, throw the key away. We'll spend the rest of our lives in pr prison. But a holy boldness came over you and it reminded me where the disciples turn, it says they turned the city upside down. That's what had happened in Nizhny Novgorod when, we, when you went on after that first campaign <laughs> now to Nizhny. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, the Lord blessed, he used you. The governor softened. He got us together with the representative of the Russian Orthodox Church said, and shake the, hands. The Archbishop kissed me. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's between you and him. And so, <laughs> and, and so and by the end of that, they said, he said, there's a greater enemy than each other, and it's communism. We don't want it to come back. So Boris Nemtsov took a stand. Yeah, he saved the day under God. He did. But thank you for your holy boldness because you could have just left, but you spoke boldly to him. I don't have time to go into all of what you said, but it made an impact Danny, on his life. The Bible says it's better to obey God than men. Absolutely. And we need to have a holy fear of God and do what God tells us to do. Absolutely. Now, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to close. I want to I pick your brain for a little bit. I want to get inside the mind mm -hmm. of Elder John Carter. There are lots of young people today, and some of it, some of maybe older folk who are watching this program. History will show, and only eternity will show, the results of the work 
of, of evangelism mm -hmm. by the Carter Report, John Carter. But there are folks wanting to start today, but they have no idea. They just say, I, I could never do anything like that. There was a point in your life you thought you never could do. Today, if somebody's watching, they're working uh, and saying, I want to do something big for God, but I don't know how to do it. What would you, I'd like you to look into the camera a moment and just talk to the folk. Firstly, you need to get your priorities straight, Danny. Mm -hmm. You got to believe the Bible. I believe in sola scriptura. I, I, I'm a Protestant. Mm -hmm. I believe in the Bible. I, I believe this is our authority. Now, when people come to me and they say it can't be done and all the rest of it, and they give me all these arguments, I don't take any notice of them because I know they're not led by the Spirit of God because they're not following the Bible. The Bible tells us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. I believe this, that people are lost without Christ. Yes. That's a terrible heresy with some people today. Jesus said, mm -mm -mm. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're not saved by becoming some other religion. We're saved through Christ. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get your priorities <clears throat> straight. Then you've got to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is given to those, not to get all worked up emotionally, but to those who obey God. You need to be able to say, I'm going to obey God. And then mm. if you step out by faith and obey God, as you have done with 3ABN, God sends in the money. Mm. Often we don't have enough money when we're running a campaign. When we start with a campaign, like when we went to India, which cost us about a million dollars, people say, well, the church gives you that. No, of course they don't. Mm -mm. Where does the million dollars come from? It comes from people out there watching the television program. Mm -hmm. And we never have the money before we start. And the money sometimes doesn't come until we're two-thirds of the way through. All right. And people say, well, we can't do anything. HMS Richards said he spoke to an Adventist Christian once, and that person said, well, you've got to have the money in the bank, brother, first. You've got to have <laughs> the money in the bank. HMS Richards said, anybody can can talk like that. That's not right. faith. Absolutely. Faith goes ahead when you don't have the money in the bank. Obey right. God, step out by faith, and also love the brethren. Okay. If you love the brethren, God will lead you and God will bless you, but you've got to get a conviction from God. All right. Elder Carter, thank you so much. Uh, we only have a few seconds left. There are people right now who would like to find information about the Carter Report. They may want to send a donation to the Carter Report. Can you give us an address? Yeah, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. That's Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. And in Australia, send your donations to the address at Terrigal. And Danny, thank you. Thank you, and God bless of you, all of you at home. Until we see you next time, may the Lord richly bless you.